Hi, everybody. Dr. Nikita Visniak here with the amazing Dr. Catherine Chung. And today we are going to be going through some micronutrients, basically talking about fats, proteins, and lipids, a little bit of fiber in there as well. Walking you through some of the key information that you should know in the nutrition text. And I have, of course, our expert, Dr. Chung, here to help be our super guide for this. So let me go to our screen share and get everybody through it. So of course, we are looking at the nutrition text here and working our way through there. And we are going to be talking about, once it loads up, whoops, one more, the basics of nutrition. So if you're following along with the text, I'm on page 12, and we're just going to review a little bit of some of the key work done by the amazing Michael Poland here, who is a food scientist and expert writer on such topics. And he basically says, Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Dr. Chung, what do you think? I love, love, love that advice. Um, I feel like nowadays we're in a um, in an abundance part of our society and we tend to eat a little bit too much of things. So um, if we are going to eat too much, it, I'd rather it be plants, but you want as much of a rainbow diet as much as possible. So I tell my patients this all the time. Yeah, it's helpful if like you did certain dietary things in short term, but a general rule just eat the rainbow and you'll and, and mostly plants and, and you'll that's be happy. what that's what works for people right is you have to give mm -hmm. little catchphrases like that because they're more likely to remember it now we hand out these nutrition books to our patients on a regular basis but it can be overwhelming because there's so much information in there when realistically eat the rainbow is something easy they can get except unless you're talking to little kids and they want to eat the rainbow and they're going to eat skittles and all that skittles. kind of stuff so don't even <laughs> don't even get me started right here. but eat the rainbow of natural sourced foods absolutely is going to be great advice right yeah all right and so if we build on there we can also see avoiding edible food like substances don't eat anything your grandparents wouldn't recognize as food maybe some elaboration on this yeah, pretty much things that are made to look like um, what they're supposed to be, but they're not. A classic example would be, um, and not to throw anything under the bus, but tofurkey, um, things that are tofu or soy based, but they're made to taste, made to look um, like something else. Another one would be like margarine as well. It's supposed mm -hmm. to, it's made to look like butter, but it's really not butter. Um, most of the time I tell my patients, I'm like, I'd rather you just eat butter then yeah. um then margin it's quite processed in that regard right so if they if it didn't exist back then probably not the best to eat it yeah realistically your body has evolved over thousands and millions of years to eat natural source substances and we're trying to fight against our evolution here by eating these food-like substances right so we're trying to avoid mm. that and this was another one. I actually have given this out to my my grade 11 daughter. She was read it. She read this whole book and reviewed it. She goes, Dad, what does this mean? Don't eat anything with more than five ingredients or ingredients you can't pronounce. What does that even mean? Oh, you're asking me that. Well, I'm asking you. <laughs> well, I basically, oh. I said to her, you're looking for simplification of the material that you're actually putting into your body. If you can't pronounce it, xanthine gum or whatever else it is, there is going to be lots of chemicals in there and combinations that your body is not used to and probably doesn't know how to handle or process those nutrients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I remember I was, I saw a little, um, what's it called? A little graphic once and they say, oh, um, a new and um, processed ingredient is just considered a chemical poop storm. It's yeah. just all these chemicals that are put in to process it in a bite-sized amount so yeah yeah absolutely and i think another good one that we can toss out there is bacteria eat real food sh so mm -hmm. should you so realistically if bacteria don't break something down there's something wrong with that now there are exceptions and honey is a great example actually but if you have other things that are going to outlast humanity like twinkies or other highly processed items <laughs> Uh, one study, I can remember they were looking at McDonald's French fries and they had them in a vat and they put them out on a counter and they just stayed as French fries forever and for all the length of the study, which was a couple of months, because nothing was going to digest them after they had been boiled in the oil and everything, right? So that's pretty yeah. crazy. It is. Always leave the table a little bit hungry. So this is another big one here that relates back to our society, how most of us actually grew up where we are told you need to finish everything on your plate, right? Yep. Um, yeah, in the Asian culture, it's just like, if for every piece of rice that's left over, you'll get a pimple for that. You're mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, you got to eat everything.
everything. Um, while that was helpful back then because portion sizes were smaller um, and also whole foods, we ate a lot of whole foods. Nowadays, because of how much, um, how big the portion sizes are, it doesn't work in our favor. And um, we'll go through this in a little bit, but there are ways to actually trick your brain into it so that um, you end up eating smaller portion sizes, no matter how much food is available to you on that table or at the buffet. That's there you go, even better. But that's a, that's a big one too. We're looking for little tricks and hacks that people can get through to make just small little micro changes that can have a huge change in the number of calories that they take in. And absolutely, we'll go into the tricks that you can use on that in a little bit here. All right. And then, of course, my most important one that I'm always recommending for patients right here, families traditionally ate together. It's actually even better than that. They would eat and prepare food together, not in front of a TV. So enjoy the meals you're eating, the preparation process with the people you love and not devices. Phones are away. TVs are off. Maybe some light music in the background or something like that will result in a much more substantial and better outcome for most patients in enjoyment of their food. Yeah, 100%. And we went through this in our previous lecture when we were talking about the anatomy and the process of digestion. And the beginning of that is how your brain gets triggered to start that digestive process and what way to trigger your brain then to cook together, to have conversations around food together and have those smells really start um, putting you in that parasympathetic state. So you get you ready to um, enjoy your food and digest your food properly too. Absolutely. And then you also have that, you know, people undervalue the little micro interactions you can have with friends and family during this meal prep time or, you know, a glass of wine, whatever it winds up being. Right. So yeah, exactly. super cool. All right. Let's get a little bit more into detail then. So we're going to look at our main nutrient sources. What should you be eating? You should be eating carbohydrates as your primary energy source, proteins as the building blocks, and then fats as another energy store and insulator. And the numbers that you have to know for most exams where people get tested on this for board exams or classroom study is going to be four and four kilocalories for, per gram for carbs and proteins and nine kilocalories per gram on fats. Anything you want to add with this, Dr. Chung? Yes. So um, I know that carbs are um, considered not the best of all the macronutrients, but it is actually really, really important. And so are fats. It's all about the amount that we're eating. And this is some uh, concept that we'll bring up over and over and over again um, throughout our lecture series about how important portion control, how important um, the amounts of the food that you're eating, um, especially with fats, when you just simply do the math, nine calories per gram, meaning every gram that you eat of fat is going to cost you cost you more calories than would say uh, carbohydrates that you would get from fresh fruit and veg mm -hmm. um, or protein like salmon or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And then back to that eating the rainbow, varied diet and portion mm -hmm. control are going to be the key things here. And fat even gets a bad name too. There's been a huge push in the US, especially over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years about the negativity associated with fat intake. But again, we're going to get into this in detail. You need fats to live. It's as simple as that. Yeah. You just have to make sure the quality of that fat is good and how you prepare that fat, right? So frying high um, temperatures on those fats they're gonna change that molecular structure of that fat. And that's where a lot of the issues actually come in rather than the actual fat itself. Cause you think of like olive oil, the Greeks have been using it forever. They've yep. been drinking it forever. They've been eating it forever. Mediterranean diet is one of the healthiest diets that they have out there. So Absolutely. why is it that they can sustain on it? But when um, olive oil is used in more of the North American society or um, the standard Canadian American diet, it's really different in terms of its effects. And it's just how we treat that oil, mm -hmm. which is high temperature cooking. Yep, absolutely. The denaturation of, well, proteins as well, potentially. Yep. Okay, let's go ahead then and get into the next thing. So talking about this dose response that we're getting at, what are dietary reference intakes? So looking at this graph, this one, the left side of the graph is showing you what would happen if you had a deficiency. You can also have toxicity. For any nutrient that we eat, you can have too little and too much. There's this EAR, estimated average requirement. There's the RDA, recommended daily allowance, and then we run into upper limits. Now, most people, when we're looking at these graphs, they are around this average intake where they may be below the RDA, but slightly into this green range. And then we have acceptable levels right here. Dr. Chung, I don't know if you want to add a little bit more to this graph here. 
Yeah, you can tell that the RDA is on that lower side, on that left side there. Um, but you can see the massive range between the RDA and the UL, the upper limit. So there is a wide range that allows you to personalize and actually eat a little bit more than you think that you can. So just because the RDA is saying, um, I'll take vitamin D, for example, 1,000, 2,000 IUs a day, um, where that RDA is, you can see that you can play around with it as well. You can go as close to the upper limit as you can healthily, and you'll still be okay. So there is, um, when it comes to getting your RDAs through food, there isn't necessarily like a dangerous where you eat too much, except for Brazil nuts. Do not eat too many <laughs> Brazil nuts. You will get a selenium toxicity on that one. So there are certain rules and stuff. But the biggest thing I wanted to actually showcase here is that you can eat more than you think. And just because you're above that RDA doesn't mean that it's necessarily dangerous for you. It's only when you're above that upper limit. And usually when you're above that upper limit is when you're over supplementation is supplementing. Um, an example, again, is a lot of my patients come in and they're on like 10,000 IUs of vitamin D per day, which is really, it's not that healthy for you either, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's where uh, we have to be careful when it comes to exogenous or pill forms of of nutrition rather than food forms of nutrition. Yeah, excellent. And I mean, that's a big thing to realize. These numbers, what the RDA is recommended daily allowance, but that's a, almost a minimal requirement when you're looking at it in a lot of cases. Realistically, based on your metabolism, based on your size, based on your eating habits and other sources of nutrients that you're taking in, this can be highly variable what you're actually mm -hmm. going to be taking and how your body processes it. So ultimately, you have to experiment for yourself a little bit. If we flip the page, then we get into something else that we should be aware of. We've been talking about this a little bit. Portion size, serving size, and nutrition labels. Everything that we see in North America has a nutrition label. It is mandated by law through the FDA that a nutrition label is there. But people get tricked all the time because the label gives you a serving size which may not be the total size of the package. And little trick, in fact, in vast majority of cases, it is not the size of the package. It's like a quarter of the package, a teaspoon, a tablespoon, or something like that. So going well, the back other day I was reading and um, on a bag of chips, it said the, the nutrition facts were based on like eight chips. I know. So give me what kind of garbage is that, right? Because literally... <laughs> You th no one opens a small little bag of chips and doesn't eat it. So they're giving you a nutritional fact based on like a, a quarter of a bag. Like, come on, yeah. right? They're, yeah, they're purposely exactly. misleading you. All yeah. right. So if we look at serving size right there, you can see at the very top, eight servings per container. And that's kind of, that's your gauge right there. So don't get tricked at the very start. Number two, yeah. we see calories. And what should we know about the calories actually, Dr. Chandra? Some good information there. Yeah. So um, the biggest thing, like Dr. Nick had already mentioned, is it's calories per serving, not per the whole thing, but overall, right? And, um, or overall, um, based on what that serving amount number one is. Number two is um, understanding how many calories that a um, an average male and female should need. So males is about 28, 2900 calories a day. And then for females, it will be about 21, 2200 calories a day, depending on one, your goals, um, and two, your, um, your metabolic rate and um, how you metabolize things, which we'll get through in the next segment. But those are the biggest things to remember about calories. And also that calories are not built all the same. And this goes back mm -hmm. to carbs, fat, and protein, and the breakdown program as well, right? So um, calories are calories. They are a number. But the quality per calorie is something that you have to keep in mind, too. Well, there's even more than that. We should have a quick discussion around empty calories that a lot of people aren't aware of. Because they think, oh, yeah. I just got to watch my numbers 2,200. But if I have 2,200, 2,600 empty calories, I'm not yeah. getting much of the support and micronutrients I need there as well, right? Yeah, and that's exactly what Dr. Nick had pointed out, where empty calories just means calories that you're eating, but give you no nutritional um, positive effect to that. There's like, it's like drinking, um, drinking a beer, I guess, right? That's an empty calorie, because it gives you some good times. But nutritionally, it doesn't really give you that much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So the other things that we can see here, you get your total fat content, cholesterol, wait a minute, shouldn't I be having no cholesterol in my diet? Um, false. Okay. <laughs> so cholesterol is extremely important for um, hormone, for um, production, for um, skin, collagen production. It also plays a massive role in terms of just cardiovascular health as well. I know that um, it's 
been made a um, a really bad or an evil thing um, that we are that we think about, and that's why we avoid eggs, egg yolks, all that stuff because your cholesterol is really high. But usually, it's more of a liver issue or too much of cholesterol rather than the actual um, ingredient itself. So we have to kind of think about again too much of a good thing. So yeah. we need cholesterol, we just don't need too much. Cholesterol. Just like we need fats as well, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the things that people often forget is cholesterol is required for you to live. You need it for cell membranes. You need it to make hormones in your body. Anything in yeah. all, like estradiol, all those good hormones, testosterone, those are all cholesterol derivatives. You are required cholesterol to make those. The next nutrient you can often see listed is sodium. Now, sodium, all I'm hearing is I've got to watch my blood pressure because of the sodium intake. Do yep. I need salt to live, Dr. Chung? <laughs> Yes, you do. Sodium, um, we have the sodium potassium pumps if we go way back into um, into basic science there, right? And the sodium potassium pumps are the things that help you produce ATP, your energy. It helps you with um, osmosis or bringing in water, helps your kidneys actually concentrate urine so you can, um, you can eliminate what you need to eliminate, right? Mm -hmm. So a zero sodium um, diet is not helpful for you because if that can actually play around with your blood pressure too, but it's also really important for uh, just production of energy and right. for you to absorb your water and all of the different aspects um, in the basic uh, physiology of your cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and exactly. Going back onto our major nutrients here as well, carbohydrates are required, as we've already said, for a healthy diet, but just the correct balance and moderation. Proteins, absolutely necessary. Again, good quality proteins. And of course, our micronutrients that we want to be here, vitamins and other nutrients that we should get right there. I thought you had a really interesting rule, your 10% rule here when you were talking about excess or bad content. Yeah. So when you're looking at like your bad content, your excess content. So when we're looking at uh, cholesterol, you're looking at your sodium, um, your, uh, your saturate, sorry, your trans fats, all of those. Uh, general rule is if it's greater than 10%, then it's too much. Mm -hmm. um, so do you want too much of a good thing? Or do you want too much of a bad thing? Mm -hmm. um, essentially is how you're going to read that label, right? So if your carbohydrates greater than 10%, that's okay, because we need carbs to live. But if your cholesterol uh, content is greater than 10%, maybe you might want to consider not eating the full bag of, say, chips, but only those eight chips that we decided on. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Perfect. All right. Okay. Good stuff. So that'll get you through it. But a key thing that a lot of people aren't aware of, even what portion size looks like. So there's simple things that you can do to just talk about portion sizes. So we can do a visual guide through your hand if you wanted to. You know, looking at the size of your fist versus the size of your thumb versus the size of your fingertip, maybe being like a teaspoon. These are rough ways to do it. But is there any tips that you give people on just measuring portion sizes? Um, no, actually, I end up I end up going with uh, these ones. If you want to be like as specific as possible, I will say my patients are very. Um, I get a lot of engineers or a lot of um very STEM type of patients, so they're just like, oh, I'm just gonna measure it, like mm -hmm. have an actual scale and stuff. But for people that are a little bit more visual, I actually do go back to this a lot, just because it's easy. And then you just like look at your hand and it's proportional to your, to your, to your body. Right. Nice. And that's what yeah. I love about the hand as well. It's just like, okay, well, you know, whose hand is that? What is this like a teaspoon? Is it a tablespoon? It doesn't really matter because that's the healthy amount for your body size. Yeah. And that's, that has huge value right there because it literally, you're saying the term proportional. So if I'm a bigger person, I have bigger hands, I need bigger intakes. If I'm smaller, I need less. What about, what if I'm somebody who's really tiny and has giant hands? Okay. <laughs> people, <laughs> some people, some of my patients like to trick around like that. Well, look at the size of my hand hands and go, yeah, that's why the portions are so large for you, right? So you maybe you yeah. want to pick a smaller, a smaller hand. But there's some interesting research that talks about tricking your brain into feeling fuller than it is. And the research is actually quite simple. If you eat, so if you look at these two plates, they both have the same number of, of food, same amount of calories are on that plate. In fact, the same nutrients right there. But your brain perceives this plate as more filling because everything is crowded more onto it. You can see it's almost overflowing. And the same thing happens with your utensils. If you choose to eat with a small fork or a small spoon, it means more bites, more cycles through. So your brain believes you're eating more food and it can control your portion size. And the big thing about this too is um, is if you're if you're eating um, smaller from a smaller plate, 
but also you're eating with a smaller fork and you're eating around people. It slows down you putting um, the food into your mouth, which means you're chewing for a little bit longer. And then that goes back to the anatomy and physiology of what we chatted about, where it helps with um, proper digestion because the enzymes get to break down that food and has more surface area for that too. So it keeps on compounding, keeps on adding on and on where you eat less, but then you're eating slower too. And even just looking at that graphic, like that small plate, I'm like, man, I feel full already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the, the other <laughs> thing is exactly what you said. It takes a while for the hormones in your body to balance out. It takes about 20 minutes from the time you start to you stop eating mm -hmm. that your brain actually realizes you're full, right? So you can be chewing away there for an extra 20 minutes that maybe you didn't need to take those calories in because it took that much time for your system to actually reach homeostasis and balance, understand that you are full. Well, and that's a big, um, that's a big, cl big clinical tool that you can use with your patients as well, where um, they're just like, well, I'm a fast eater, I don't know how to slow down and stuff. A, a few tips is asking them to just count the amounts of chews that they're having, and then that will naturally slow them down. Mm -hmm. But also because of that 20 minutes, um, you could they can finish off their plate. And then you just say, hey, put a timer on, you know, maybe just um, do something else, read a book, whatever it may be for 20 minutes, and then see if you're actually still hungry. Because um, if you're not, then great, maybe just have some water, or like eat a little like some fruit or whatever it may be, um, instead of going for that second plate again, and then you accidentally overeat. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I mean, all this is great advice for us to start with right here. All right. So mm -hmm. next time when we get together, we are going to be going into we don't need to go into this stuff yet. We are going to be going into more specifics. Actually, I think we have some time right now. Let's go ahead and do this. So we're talking more about carbohydrates specifically right here. So again, remembering carbohydrates, four kilocalories per gram that we're going to go through. Mm -hmm. So what are some mm -hmm. of the key things? I also put fiber on this page in the book, just because they kind of lay out well together, being polysaccharides and kind of similar derivatives, but they have very different functions. But mm -hmm. what are some of the key things that I should know about for carbohydrates, Dr. Chong? The key things to know is that they are required. Actually, the key thing to know is that carbs are required for you to live, very similar to cholesterol. It's all about the quality and the quantity of that of those carbohydrates. And you can see um, on the page, the functions of the carbohydrates down on the left-hand side there, what they're used for. You can see it's a lot of structure. It's a lot of energy source as well. Um, and you need to be able to rebuild and recover and that's why carbs are so important post-workouts. Um, but they're also really important to feed your brain and make it help you feel full. So it's just, just that you don't want too much. And that's where fiber comes in because they're very similar in structure. And if you're going to have a lot of your uh, carbohydrates, then you might as well have them in fiber so that your digestive um, bowel movements are um, in, in, the, in the proper amount and you're not having too much constipation. Or yeah, like that you get too. everything in sync when you find a good balance of food, good blood good gut, gut biome and all that working together, right? Mm -hmm. Good optimal benefits right here. So a couple of key things to realize, what do we basically run on? Our fuel of choice whenever possible is the glucose, right? We're taking in carbohydrates. We break them down with different enzymes like salivary and pancreatic amylase, and we wind up absorbing them through the microvilli into the bloodstream as glucose. And what happens mm -hmm. when you eat refined carbohydrates? This is a glycemic index graph we're showing right here is you get this spike in glucose levels. And what we're trying to do is have a more moderate approach to glucose. So what kind of things, Dr. Chung, will spike my glucose levels? Uh, things that are all on the right side here. So those simple carbohydrates, things that will um, don't take too much of a process, don't take too much of a time and will just hit right away. Essentially, if you think of simple carbohydrates, simple carbs are all white, um, white things. So white bread, white pasta, um, white rice that have been highly processed stripped and all you have left is the carbohydrate. It's the same thing as if you just ate white sugar. It's like hitting the the mm -hmm. um, blood sugars. It's just hitting the brain real, real quick. And then as, as quickly as it comes, it will go quickly as well. And that's why you get that spike and then that crash. And a lot of my patients feel that after they have a high, high carb um, lunch, and then they're just like, holy man, I'm like absolutely spent and tired. I need a nap at like 1 p.m. Because you get a refractory period where your body actually overcompensates and the levels drop down too low. And this cycling up and down is what's really hard on your pancreas and other organs, right? Yep, exactly. And like understandable, you know, uh, with certain lifestyles or even 
financial uh, budgets as well, sometimes, you know, those, uh, the simple carbs are the, are the way to go for you and your life, then it's all about how are you going to mix those simple carbs to make them slower in absorption so your body doesn't hit as fast right and that's where food combining comes in so if you do your you have your simple carbs but you have a healthy fat with it or if you have protein that naturally will slow down that process that dr nick has went through um at the bottom right corner there and then that will keep you satiated for longer but you won't get such a hit and that's why um what was it the um bulletproof coffee was so um so uh so useful and such a trend because all that fat really slowed down the absorption of that coffee. And mm -hmm. then you're just jonesing for a long period of time. It's like the same um, aspect of things, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you were, were just looking at the carbs, choosing the complex carbs, so that top left corner, um, those are going to be really important. And when you think of complex carbs, those are like the brown things, the things mm -hmm. that take a little bit longer, they have appeal on it, they have um, more structures, for your body to have to deal with. So the more complex, the more grainy it is, um, the more housing it has, that's going to be uh, the thing that slows everything down because it just takes more time to break it down. And they probably have better sources of isomers of micronutrients as well. So more different variations of different things rather than the refined mm -hmm. ultra processed food that we know is one of the major problems we see in North America with our diets right now. Yeah, I believe what is it? Um, it's 80 to 85% of all your nutrients are stripped through the processing mm -hmm. um, um, a process, I guess. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and move on then really quick. Going to talk about proteins here. The building blocks. Again, you can get energy from proteins, but proteins are also used for you to build things. So on a basic level, we eat proteins, they're broken down by hydrochloric acid, trypsin, chymotrypsin, all that into peptides. The peptides are broken down into amino acids, and then we absorb those into the bloodstream. Dr. Chung, what do I need to know about proteins? Um, proteins are both animal sourced, but they are also um, plant sources as well. And you want a mixture of the two. And the reason for that is because there are risk factors to having high amounts of animal protein, um, just based on the processing. Wild game is a little bit on the different side, I would say. So if you know a hunter and they've like hunted wild game and then they process that, um, that animal, it's quite different than the um, processing aspect of farm-raised um, animals mm -hmm. or meats that Absolutely. we have currently, right? Um, it's just because of um, just uh, human intervention of how they're raised. Mm -hmm. uh, but not all protein is made the same. So if you have higher fat content marbled into the protein, uh, um, it does increase cardiovascular risk in some senses as well. And that's why there are those health issues related to certain proteins. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Nick brought up a really important point about um, how proteins can break down into your different amino acids. And those amino acids are going to be the building blocks for pretty much your whole, um, your whole body, whether it's muscle, skin, hormones, neurotransmitters, so mental health stuff, if you don't have good sources of protein, and you don't have yet hit by all these different amino acids, and these micronutrients, then it's going to have a detrimental effect on your whole body, not just one aspect of your body. Absolutely. And a lot of people undervalue the natural source of proteins from, like you were saying, wild game or organic free range, true free range eggs or whatever else it winds up being. Now, another thing a lot of people don't realize is because we see a lot of vegan diets and things out there. And I've tried many of these diets myself in the research and the writing of this book is that you, even if you are strict vegan, you are actually still getting animal proteins on a regular basis because your own cells are sloughing off into your GI tract and being digested as well. So you are getting all of the lining of your mucosa from your nasal, all, oral, all the way down from your throat and everything that your body is also auto digesting as a normal process. So the key thing is also finding exogenous outside of the body sources for a lot of this nutrient as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so that'll get us through that right there. The next thing we're going to finish off with here really fast is going to be us talking about fats and lipids. Now, these are unique beasts, these fats and lipids, because the way that they're absorbed. If you have a fat-soluble vitamin, A, D, E, and K, those can become toxic because you wind up storing things in your fats versus most water-soluble vitamins and nutrients kind of get flushed through the body relatively quickly. Dr. Chung, what do I need to know about fats and fat metabolism? Um, so fat and fat metabolism, 
metabolism, there are different types of fats. Um, so you can, uh, and there's different precursors to those essential fats as well, which you'll see in the bottom right hand corner. But look at that, we can see that um, fat is also um, used um, in the form of cholesterol. There, so that's why it's super important to have cholesterol um, coming through the diet, but also phospholipids. So what are phospholipids? Phospholipids are the things that help the integrity of your cell lining. So if you don't have those phospholipids, then you're not going to be absorbing your nutrients properly. You're not going to have a really healthy, robust digestive tract that allows for it. And also you have all your mucosal lining. So dry mouth, tongue, eyes, all those things will be extra, extra dry. Mm -hmm. So that's why fats are so important. Now, exactly what Dr. Nick is saying, it's um, how we're treating the fats, but also uh, the sources of the fats that are going to be the most important. So when we're looking at the precursors, um, right in that, and that um, where Dr. Nick is circling, there. Uh, you have arachidonic acid, you have EPA, DGLA as well. Um, and then under EPA, there is also DHA. So the most common ones that we'll kind of um, bring up to mind is EPA and DHA, because that's going to be in a lot of our supplements, the omega-3 mm -hmm. supplements. But EPA is the one that's going to be the most important in terms of helping as an anti-inflammatory. Now we're looking, when we're looking at um, arachidonic acid, just the one above, you can see there it says, Says that it's produced from other omega-6 precursors. Now, omega-6 and omega-9 are actually pro-inflammatory. Um, and that's the one omega, or the two omegas, I guess, that are actually found at a higher ratio um, in our standard Canadian and American diet comparative to EPA um, or omega-3. So um, when we're looking at a lot of our uh, inflammatory processes and the um, I guess the quality of our food and the quality of these fats, you actually want to lean on those omega threes because they're going to be the most helpful for you as an anti inflammatory. And that's why when you're looking at those good sources, walnuts, soybean oil, tuna, avocado oil, all of those are omega three high and omega six low naturally. So we want to kind of lean on those. Um, and like we said already, how you process those oils, but also how you treat and cook those oils. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be really important too, in terms of not messing up their integrity, not messing up their, um, their uh, what's it called, their chemical structure, and use it in a way that they're supposed to be used instead of um, as, a, as a cooking oil, essentially, for example. Yeah. I always say this is one of the key things I say to patients. I just love it. I think it's fantastic. I say nature's ice cream is avocados. You should literally just take a spoon <laughs> and be scooping out pure avocado whenever you can, unprocessed and away you go. Nature's yep. ice cream. All right. So I want to thank Dr. Chung very much for joining us today to go through some of these basic nutritional components here that we talked about. So just as a quick summary, some of the key notes that we went over for today's class included basics of portion and serving size and how you can trick your brain by using a smaller plate and smaller utensils. We also talked about carbohydrates, proteins, fats, fiber as well. And we gave you some big tips that you can use. I love Dr. Chung's Eat the Rainbow. I think it's fantastic. Is there anything else you would add that we should have people know? I think the biggest thing is um, personalization and not um, over in, um, over indulging in any diet. And by overindulging, I mean, going too strict with certain mm -hmm. rules and certain things, right? So um, give you, yourself the freedom. And um, again, eat the rainbow. I think that's, that's right. the biggest thing. Nice. I mean, really what this gets into is people's habits. And if you try to create a too strict or too hard of a diet for somebody to follow, it's just not going to happen. And if they're just going to go back to their original habits anyway, in which case you haven't really served that person or yourself very well by trying to be ultra rigid with it. That's what I love about everything that you're doing, Dr. Chung, is whenever we're talking about this, it's always into moderation, making baby steps that are actually realistically possible for that person and giving them those cinnamon buns. This is my little <laughs> cheerleader hand saying, yes, you can. <laughs> we're just there to support people through that. So hundred percent. Well, that's like the most important thing, right? Is um, we always want to be careful when it comes to nutrition because the, um, the whole movement around orthorexia as well, like the last thing that we want to uh, be imparting onto people around us and our own clients and patients is the idea that they have to be super rigid and that you give them a body dysmorphia in the opposite spectrum mm -hmm. too, right? Um, so that's the, that's the harm that we can potentially cause. And we always have to be mindful of that. All right. You can do it. We can help. 
Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. And we'll see you again on the Thank next you. video. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. All right.